going to talk to you today about the dangers of hyper soul winning. Uh, this is a message I've been planning for uh, years now and a subject I've been wanting to confront but just praying about it and Lord how do you want me to handle this thing and and I've had numerous people contact me and, and uh, ask me you know could you do a study on this what are your opinions on this and things and I know that this is a subject that a lot of Bible believers really struggle with and um, this thing of winning souls and um, I have said many many times in my studies I put pressure on people to win souls and uh, I, I believe that it's a Christian's responsibility to witness to the lost to preach the gospel I believe all that stuff but unfortunately Satan has come in he's crept in and he's introduced this hyper soul winning thing um, that's just winning souls win souls win souls win souls it's that's the most important thing just soul winning soul winning soul winning you got to be out knocking doors and and doing this and doing that and you get this whole thing and this extreme pressure is put upon you when's the last time you won a soul to Jesus Christ and everything and and you never stop to ask yourself wait a second what does the Bible actually teach on this subject and you know as soon as you hear anything negative instantly you start going uh oh uh oh like this is it negative just to look and see what the scriptures say same thing with church buildings you know I tell people don't go to church there's still part of me that goes oh, like oh I shouldn't say that but that's what the Bible teaches the Bible doesn't say that there's some building someplace called a church that you have to go to you're required to be there every time the doors are open the Bible doesn't teach that so why do we have such strong emotions it's because of mind control if you think mind controls out in Hollywood or in the CIA some black ops type of thing and not in the church you are sadly mistaken uh, there's a lot of mind control that goes on all right a whole lot of it and I am going to tell you right now that this hyper soul winning movement is very powerful mind control and we're going to be talking about that I'm going to prove it to you in this study again if you are got an attitude and you're some cultic follower of these Jack Hiles movement or any derivative thereof you know uh, and you're just gonna shut your mind down and I don't care what you have to say you're a stinking heretic because you question our holy righteous beliefs your beliefs need to come from the book all right and we're gonna be going over a lot of different points today this is probably gonna be a pretty long study maybe probably two parts hopefully not three but uh, there's a bunch of scriptures here you know again I get accused well you know you don't cover the scriptures. I cover a lot more scriptures than most people do and I'm not saying that as a matter of, you know, pat myself on the back. I'm just declaring a fact. All right. We're going to be going over quite a few scriptures here. But let's begin with this thing of what is this modern day soul winning? Going out and saying, pardon me, sir, could I have a moment of your time? I'd like to ask you today, if you were to die tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? Do you know if you would go to heaven or hell? Well, could I just take a minute or two here to explain to you how that you can know for sure that you can go to heaven when you die? Um, can I give you this gospel track? Can I do this? Can I do that? And whatever, you know, do you church? Do you do you fellowship fellowship somewhere here locally? Do you go to church? Do you have belief in God? Do you blah, 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 blah? see? Stop for a minute and just ask yourself, okay, where is this coming from? Every belief that you have, every single belief that you have, needs to line up here with the Bible. Every single one of them. There's nothing that you believe in that you shouldn't question and say, does this line up with the scriptures? But where does this whole movement come from? Well, let's go back in time. All right. We're just going to go back to the founding of America because American quote unquote soul winning is what hyper soul winning is all about. The American branch of hyper soul winning, it comes from America. So we're going to talk about the history of this thing, what this whole win souls, win souls, win souls, where did it come from? Okay, way back, you go back to, we'll say the 1500s or so, all right, over in Europe, the European countries and things. You were starting to have the Reformation getting really strong under Martin Luther and John Huss and a lot of these, I mean, he was, John Huss was before Luther, but the point is a lot of these guys are really starting to make problems for the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church pretty much controlled everything, both politics through the kings that were subservient to the Pope and then they also controlled all the churches. All of religion, all of politics was controlled by Roman Catholicism. Again, this is proven history. 
All right, this isn't just my opinions because I don't like Roman Catholics or something. All right, this is the crown heads of Europe were controlled by the papacy. All right, and then you had like King Henry VIII broke off because of his, you know, desire for uh, marrying another woman and things, and the Pope wouldn't grant him that, so he said, okay, I'll start the Anglican Church and whatever. So the, you know, there were Bible-believing Christians before that that were there, small groups, you know, living out in the wilderness areas and things, the Waldenses, the, the Vaudois, the, there was a bunch of groups and things like that so that were not part of the Protestant Reformation. Again, another thing that a lot of people don't understand, and these groups date back before Roman Catholicism even showed up. But, and it, you know, the Catholics just called them heretics down through the centuries. All right, so you had three groups, basically. According to Catholic historians, you have... Roman Catholicism, the uh, quote-unquote true church, the apostolic church. Then you had, uh, well, actually, I should say four groups. You had Catholics, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, and then you had what later became Protestants, and then you had the fourth group, heretics. Those that were, you know, they would say that they were, uh, you know, Catholic, but then they strayed off into heresy or something like this or whatever else, and so they had to be kind of eliminated and executed. And things like that. Yeah, those were the true Bible-believing Christians. All right, not the Orthodox, not the Protestants, and certainly not the Catholics. But you have this whole system there. And what happened is, with the Reformation, brought new quote-unquote freedoms um, from the tyranny of Rome, from that control. But you went from Catholics controlling organized religion to now Protestants controlling organized religion. So you know, like a during uh, Oliver Cromwell's day, I remember reading that back early 1600s, right around the time that our King James Bible was translated, early to mid 1600s, I should say, it was mostly Episcopalian, Church of England there, the Anglicans, I should say, Episcopalians more American, but Church of England and the Puritans. They were the two groups that were fighting back and forth over the Bishop's Bible or the Geneva Bible, Geneva being for the Puritans, Bishops for the you know, Church of England the official state church of England. And they wanted to make one translation that would be not have the biases of either the Geneva or the bishops. And that's where your King James Bible came from. And of course, the Lord was involved in this translation here. But for Christians that said, okay, I want to read the Bible for myself, and they're looking and they're going, okay, uh, Calvinistic Puritanism is not right. It doesn't line up with numerous scriptures, and this Anglican stuff certainly doesn't line up. It's just basically Catholicism under a different name, all the high liturgy and all the, you know, stuff, you know, all the uh, baptismal regeneration, baptizing infants and stuff that takes away the stain of original sin and all that stuff. That, and people go, well, I'm reading the Bible for myself here, and neither of these two systems are correct. So what do I want to do? Well, I'm going to worship the Lord my own way. Oh, but you see, you couldn't because the tyranny is still there of the Church of England and even the Puritans, too. They'd put people to death, you know. And so you have, oh, and there's Scotch Presbyterians as well. That was another group. They were also, you know, Calvinistic. But you had all of these Puritan, or excuse me, Protestant type uh, denominations that were coming, and they were, you know, the, the governments were becoming Protestant, but they were still not allowing somebody like me to exist. Um, me coming out and, and speaking against Protest, Protestantism and Catholicism certainly and Orthodox type of stuff and whatever, I'd be labeled as a heretic. They would have put me to death. You know, Cromwell, thankfully, he was a Puritan, but there were actually cases where he would defend people's liberty of conscience. That became one of the things that he was very big for. You know, if you're not hurting anybody, if you're not preaching to go around and murdering people and stuff like this, then you can believe what you want to believe. All right? And that's the way I believe, too, by the way. I'm never going to put a Muslim to death or a Catholic to death or a Protestant or whatever else. You know, just not going to do that. But you had these small groups of people, and they're saying, okay, we can't be under Catholic-dominated countries, and we can't be under the Puritans. Or I keep wanting to say Puritans. <laughs> Well, that's there, but the Protestants. We can't be under either group. They won't allow us to have freedom to interpret the Bible the way the Holy Spirit shows us. So, what are we going to do? 
Well, that's where you have them coming. They were separatists, separate from the Church of England, separate from the Catholic Church, separate from the Orthodox system. And they were saying, we just want to read the Bible for ourselves and live according to Scripture. Bible-believing Christians, you understand? And they started to come to America. You know, and it was, again, it was an illegal thing, you know, the early pilgrims and stuff like this. Um, and, you know, you'll have differences between pilgrims and Quakers and, uh, you know, I think some of the, the, there were different groups and things like that. And some of the early, early Baptists, which bear no resemblance to modern day independent fundamental Baptists, because uh, they're just another Puritan, or uh, I keep saying Puritan. <laughs> they're just another Protestant sect. I don't know why I keep saying Puritan. They do have some similarities to Puritans, though. But, but the whole point is, separatist groups came to America because they wanted to live according to the Scriptures and not with all the high church traditions of both Protestant and Catholic. All right? So that's what you had here early on in America. And so here in America, you would have groups, pockets of people that are Bible-believing Christians, and then you would have Puritans that came a lot in uh, New England states and things like that, the infamous Salem witch trials and things. And, you know, there's a bunch of stuff I could say about that. But you had Puritans, you know, Cotton Mather was a, was a big Puritan here in America. And they would put people to death that disagreed with them. They would, you know, they had a lot of their, you know, uh, really weird rules and things like that. And, you know, again, the story of the Scarlet Letter, you had the woman that committed adultery and they made her sew a big red A on her, the front of her dress and things like this. And, you know, all these rules of the Puritan system. And you had Bible believers that were saying, I don't want to be part of the, the Puritans, the Protestants, the Catholics. I don't want any of that stuff. They were separatists. And this led to how are they going to go and spread the gospel? Well, a lot of the early uh, circuit riding preachers, they would go out and they would ride and they would go spread the gospel. And then when they would uh, you know, get people saved, they would establish little churches. And the churches that were established in early America were people meeting in homes, people meeting in fields. I mean, look at Roger Williams, the supposed founder of the Baptist church in America. He was meeting in fields. They didn't have a building there. His, the people that he founded there in Providence, Rhode Island, you know, the God's divine providence and things, Again, there's a lot of details I need to go into here. Roger Williams was basically an Anglican, you know, and he was officially licensed and ordained clergy and the whole deal. And he started to actually read the Bible for himself, you know, and started to go against some of his um, church rules and things. And they kicked him out. And they basically kicked him out so badly that they sent him out into the, into the wilderness to die during the winter. And, you know, if you're in New England, you know that the uh, winters get very harsh up here. I mean, we're in northern Maine, so we get, you know, the worst of it up our way. But even down Rhode Island, it's, it's bad. It get really cold in the wintertime. And just to be out wandering through the woods, you know, bad deal. But, you know, God, you know, preserved his life. And he founded a group of, uh, you know, Anabaptist type of people. I'd, I hate to use the term Baptist because people associate it with modern day Baptists and it's not the same. But Roger Williams never had a church building. And that early congregation that he was a part of uh, later on in the 1700s, 1700 the year I think actually, was when they first built their first church building. And later on John D. Rockefeller actually gave money to help restore that church building. So you know which way that church building went. As all of them do, they're all pagan temples. But you have these early Christians, they're going out and they're spreading the gospel. While they're doing that, you have the same Protestants, the same Puritans from over in Europe coming here and setting up state churches. Again, you can read stories of, of uh, these circuit riding preachers or itinerant missionaries, they would call them, where they would go out and they would be preaching the gospel and the local magistrate would come by and he'd say, what church are you a part of? You're not supposed to be doing this. You know, and they would take him out and they would whip them publicly, flog the guy publicly. So what was the very first amendment to the Constitution when it finally came about, when the Revolutionary War finally happened? Um, freedom of religion. That's what the Revolutionary War was really all about. Okay, and all then everybody was Christian here in America. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But that's why a lot of the people rose up and fought because the very most basic freedom that you have is the freedom to worship God. 
according to your beliefs in the scriptures. And somebody starts trying to take that away from you, you're living in the worst type of slavery that there is. Okay? So you had this, the circuit riding preachers kind of disorganized and, and, you know, going out and trying to get people saved. And then they would start little churches, little groups of people, you know. And sometimes they built little buildings, little meeting houses to meet in. Again, I'm not against that because the people were not, they'd go to these little meeting houses. They were not wearing a Sunday best and, you know, doing the whole following Catholic liturgical practices like a lot of the modern day, even Baptists do, you know. And so they had these little things there and they weren't saying our church is holy and whatever else. It was just like a shed, basically. Um, I mean, the, the, the church, I was a false church I was raised in, it started out this tiny little building, very, very small little building way, way, way back. And then they built on and built on and built on. Now it's this huge, big mega building. But circuit riding preachers led to camp and revival meetings. The big camp meetings, these big revival meetings, they'd be meeting out in the woods many times. Thousands of people would show up to these things. They'd set up a big tent or they'd build a, a like a barn open on all sides. And then they'd have the platform there and the guy would be up there preaching. No PA system, no speakers, no nothing else. The speakers, the, you know, they're the ones up on the stage, <laughs> the, the men that preach. And these guys, you know, the famous, famous uh, some of the famous guys that were around doing that. I'll show you one of the guys here. Peter Cartwright, famous circuit riding uh, Methodist preacher. Um, another one from back in that time period, and he was a Calvinist, but he was not like high church Calvinistic, put other people to death type of a deal. Another guy there, George Whitfield. All right. Again, I've studied this thing of church history. It's a, it is an interesting study. But these camp meetings led to people, um, they'd go out and they would, they would, uh, tell people about this, this meeting and they'd have, these are public meetings. Okay. Just like you would have had in the book of Acts. They're going out, they're traveling, they're bringing people and they're saying, okay, we're going to have a public meeting. Anybody can come into this thing. It's not a church building. You don't have to wear your Sunday best. It's not all the stuff that goes along with these modern day church buildings. But what happened? Well, in time, a lot of these guys started to get pretty famous and the early circuit riding, camp meeting, turned into evangelists. And you had guys like Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, J. Uh, J. Weber, or I'm thinking of J. Frank Norris. Um, uh, what's the guy's name? I think John, is it John Wilbur Chapman? Can't think of his name right now. But you had a lot of these guys in the mid to late 1800s that went from camp meetings, the humble camp meeting that's basically outdoors, and you went from that to now these big tents that they would erect. And then it started to turn into big, huge church buildings. And these guys are meeting at, you know, uh, Madison Square Garden in New York. And, they, and they're, they're meeting in all these huge, big places. Again, you can study this stuff. You can, you can find out I'm telling you the truth on this thing. And that's when this thing of soul winning started to get very popular. You know why? Because they had big buildings that they needed to pay for. Oh, well, now, brother. Oh, brother, no, not than me. Okay, I understand church history. That's what it's all about. Bring them in. Get them in at any cost. we got to get these people in. And all of a sudden, you started to have John D. Rockefeller financing Billy Sunday. And a lot of these other guys, Sam Jones, another big Masonic, big name preacher. Bob Jones Sr. A lot of these guys, and of course, later on, it became Billy Graham. Of course, Billy Graham is totally Masonic, totally in bed with Rome and everything else. But you see, they started bringing these people in and it started to be, you need to win souls. You need to win souls. You know, and you say, what's that mean? Get them here. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. And then where did that go? Well, from the famous evangelists, we started to have large buildings. We can't meet in fields anymore. We can't meet out in the forest anymore. We need to have these big tabernacles built. And hey, while we're at it, why don't we make it a little bit more permanent? 
because we got a lot of people here. So let's start to bring in all these big, you know, groups of people, and we'll build these big, huge buildings for them. And those market-driven churches, because that's what they became, they started to need even more people. And now we have sister churches being formed. We just, you know, we're, we're just, we've grown to capacity here. We need to build a sister church. We need to move into another building. We need to buy more property. And we get, got to get obtain more real estate and everything else. This is really up into the 1900s now. Let me ask you a question. Um, over, you know, over the course of the, the period there, of, of the early 1900s up through the 1960s and 70s, we'll say in that time period, um, more and more people are quote-unquote getting saved at that point in time. And all these powerful revivals and all this other stuff going on. And I realize, you know, some of it is starting to go downhill there. But the point is, church building growth was, was exponential in that time here in America. And, of course, it was spilling over into other countries as well. But America is the real focus of this whole movement. Um, was the moral condition of people getting better? As more uh, souls were being saved? No. It was getting worse. You know why? Because it wasn't a movement of the Holy Spirit. And of course, you know, you can look into a lot of these guys that were, you know, building these big, huge church buildings, you know, with the, the, their big followings and stuff like that. They're masons. Who's going to be building church buildings? Because, you know, I mean, you go back far enough, you, you know, a lot of the, you know, actual stone masons, real guys that were doing brick and mortar type of thing, um, a lot of those guys were gilded. In other words, you had to be part of a certain company that did stonemasonry work. And those guys, a lot of times, were Freemasons. Again, that's how the whole system got started. Can't get into all the whole history of uh, the whole Freemasonic system. But it's guild-based occultism, secret society. So again, you have a preacher that's a member of the Masonic Lodge. He's going to get his brother Masons to build the big church buildings. That's why so many of these big church buildings, you do the research, it's masons a lot of times that build them. A lot of these Baptist churches have Masonic cornerstones. I've showed it in, in some of my videos. Some of these you know, older Baptist churches. So, again, this whole thing, it became market-driven. It became about, you know, we got to get people in. We need quantity over quality is what the whole thing, you know, happened there. So, what happens? Well, Hyper soul winning comes in and replaces true biblical conversion. Where now it's not about, you know, uh, preaching the gospel and people get to make the decision on their own and you, you, you know, until they get under conviction. I mean, there were stories back in the 1800s, some of the, you go back to the early camp meetings, they tell pe people come forward, you know, to be saved and they, the preacher get to talking to them, they'd say, you're not ready to be saved yet. I mean, there was a, there was a case, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Civil War general from, uh, down south, and uh, he was also co-founder of the Ku Klux Klan, and uh, you know, wicked man. But he came forward to one time to get saved. I remember reading the story, and and uh, he was you know crying and weeping, and I mean, just, I need to be saved. And the preacher looked at him. And he said, "You're not broken enough yet. You're not ready to be saved." He knew the guy still had some pride issues that he needed to get that stuff going before he was truly broken, where he can say, "Okay, I'm, please God, save me now." But you see, you don't want to do that if you got to get that money, if you got to get those people in the door. we got pews that need to have people sitting in them, you see, if we're going to finance this big building. And all of a sudden you start driving past these big church buildings and you see these thermometers. You still see them today. These thermometers, you know, and the red level comes up, you know, for how many donations, you know. We need to replace the roof or we need to buy new carpet, you know. Uh, give some money towards the offering and we'll put your little piece of carpet with your name on it on the bulletin board so people can see how holy you are. Don't even kid me, okay? I've been there. I was raised in church buildings. I was raised in this system. Don't even talk to me about it. Oh, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So soul winning becomes the main thing. Why? Not because they're concerned for people's souls, but because they need to get these people in. But then it takes on an even deadlier turn, and that's where we are today. 
soul winning becomes a matter of pride and contention. What, what are you criticizing me for? When's the last time you led somebody to the Lord, huh? I mean, you personally. Are you out on the streets? I go out, I go out five times a week. I'm out 50 hours out of a 40-hour week. You know, I have led thousands to the Lord. What are you doing for Jesus Christ? I was going to play some audio of some of these guys from back in this 1960s era and stuff like that. One of them was Glenn Shunk, this guy. And I mean, oh my word, I mean, he just rips your hide off. Just, when's the last time you want a soul to Jesus Christ? You know, if you're not leading 12 people a, a week to the Lord, you're not right with God. I mean, just screaming at you and stuff like this. Winning souls, winning souls, winning souls. And it becomes a pride issue where you're just scared to death. Somebody asks you the question, When's the last time you personally led someone to the Lord? And you're like, um, uh, 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 well, you know, uh, and you see these people, I personally have led so many to the Lord and whatever else. Jack Hiles was one that, that really started this whole, this hyper soul winning of pride issue thing. He turned it up to, you know, fever pitch. I mean, this guy, he took it to a whole new level. I mean, the guy was a wicked man, completely wicked. Even his own daughter came out and said, yeah, my dad was, you know, having an adulterous affair with the, the secretary, uh, Jenny Nishik, and things like that. Even she admitted it. The guy's wife, or the, excuse me, the, you know, you know uh, uh, Jenny Nishik, I was thinking Vicky. <laughs> Jenny Nishik, her husband, Vic, uh, one of Hiles' deacons, and he came out and he's like, you know, I got, he forced me to live in my basement and he's, he's, you know, messing around with my wife and everything else, ruined my marriage, paid for the divorce, all this other stuff. But you know what? Any Hiles follower right now is going to say, you're a liar, you're a deceiver. Why? Because Jack Hiles won souls to Jesus Christ. So you can do all kinds of wickedness and be involved in all kinds of evil and horrible things. But if you're a soul winning preacher, Everything's forgiven. You're far more spiritual than other people. Yeah. And they will use that thing on you big time. Again, I've been through every type of Baptist church that there is except for liberal Baptist churches. I didn't really go to the modern ones with rock music and whatever else. I've been through uh, Hiles Anderson type of Baptist churches. The whole thing of the hyper soul winning, the yelling, screaming preachers, the whole deal. I've been through those. I've been through the Bible believing like Ruckman type of, you know, Baptist churches. I've been to Bob Jones University type of Baptist churches. I've been to Tennessee Temple type Baptist churches. I've been to I've been to all the different types of conservative Baptist churches. And it wasn't I went I went and visited for 2 weeks and then left. I was there, I was involved, I was at, in the pastor's homes, talking to the pastors, getting to know them personally, going out doing knocking on doors, I've done straight preaching, I've gone out, done all that stuff, okay? Again, I'm an insider, okay? An ex-insider to the whole movement. I know the pride. I know all about it. I've seen it for years and years and years and years and years that soul-winning preachers can get away with anything. I've seen it. So, that's basically where the whole thing came from. This whole movement of this hyper soul winning thing. And let me you know, just say it right up front. I'm not against preaching the gospel. I am not against witnessing to the lost. Absolutely. Those are great things. And I'm going to be showing you the biblical way to do it today. And I'm going to show this, this hyper soul winning thing, I will tell you right now, has damned more people to hell than anything else in the entire history of man. I'll say it the entire history of the church. I'll say it that way. Christianity. All right. You go back to the Dark Ages. I'm going to tell you, you know, well, it's essentially a second Dark Ages that we have now, this whole hyper soul winning thing. All right. And I'm going to show you the Bible condemns this modern movement of hyper soul winning. But let's go to the favorite passage of the hyper soul winner, their motto, their theme verse, Proverbs chapter 11. You know, probably you get those that are these narrow-minded bigots, you know, 
the modern day uh, Jack Hiles movement, if you don't haven't figured it out already, it's being led by Stephen Andersnake and his little cult following, his little active duty Andersnake zombies, I call them. And uh, they're the new ones, you know, the, the soul winners. We're soul winning, soul winning marathon, soul winning crusade, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. You know, not even preach the right gospel. He's a soul dammer, he's not a soul winner. But let's, let's check this thing out here, their favorite verse. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Okay? He that winneth souls is wise. Okay? Now, first of all, we'll get back to the winning souls thing, but let's look at the first part of that there. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Let's check on that. Matthew chapter 7. What is the thing of bearing fruit? Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 20. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Jesus gives a standard to anybody, and I realize this is before he died on the cross and whatever, but this is instruction and in righteousness for anybody. I mean, it's just common sense. A tree is known by its fruit. You walk up to an oak tree and I say, stand here, just wait a minute, watch, it's going to grow cherries. Huh? That's not possible. You can't get cherries from an oak tree. Oh, yeah, sure you can. This is, in fact, if you wait a little bit longer, it's going to grow bananas. You say, well, you're bananas, but it's not going to grow any. <laughs> All right. Um, a tree is known by its fruit. You see? Somebody comes along and they say, I'm a Christian. You can look at the fruit of their life and you can say, uh, you know, how long have you been saved? You know, a couple months. Well, okay, I'm going to give you some leeway there. Oh, I've been saved for 50 years. I got saved when I was two years old in Sunday school. And I'm a soul winner and active and blah, blah. And you go, okay, I heard you using profanity there. I heard you telling a dirty joke. I heard this and that. What in the world? You know, and then you look at what they believe about the Bible and you go, you don't even believe correct biblical doctrine here. You can tell that fruit is corrupt by the fact that it produces corrupt food, fruit. You see? Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. It says here, and when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up, and bare fruit." trees known by its fruit and hundredfold and when he had said these things he cried he that hath ears to hear let him hear and his disciples asked him saying what might these this parable be and he said unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of god but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand now the parable is this the seed is the word of god these by the wayside are they that hear then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Before I continue, remember the seed thing later on. That'll be important. You can see, because good uh, fruit bears seeds as well. Verse 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And they which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. 
but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Hmm. Is there a difference between true converts and false converts? A lot of these uh, modern day Baptists, Baptist Catholics, I just combine it into one word, if you aren't familiar with that. A lot of these modern day Baptists will try to say that these are all saved people. All four groups are saved. Just the three groups, the first three are carnal. You know, they're just carnal. We've, you know, we've gone out, we knock on doors, we got 20,000 saved, you know, this afternoon. And, uh, you know, the ones that never amount to anything and don't bear fruit, well, they're just carnal Christians. No, they're called false converts that you damned to hell. That's the truth of the matter. A lot of this whole, oh, we've had this great soul winning marathon, this great soul winning crusade. I was talking about this with my wife this morning. She said, it's funny because what do you do in a marathon? You're racing to win. I know the Bible says that we're to run with patience, the race is set before us and everything else, the course is set before us. I understand that. But uh, is there pride in a marathon? Mm -hmm. Is there pride in this modern soul winning movement? little bit yeah pretty incredible but you see there's supposed to be fruit there true conversion produces fruit again we're going to be talking about that as we go through this study go back to proverbs chapter 11 proverbs chapter 11 Verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Hmm. So the fruit that's there that's supposed to be produced uh, comes from true conversion, from being, from righteousness that comes upon that person. God's imputed righteousness. Yeah. Oh, we've won, you know, so many people to the Lord, but there's not, you know, Sometimes they don't always bear fruit. Then they didn't get saved. Just as simple as that. But if you remember another thing that we read there in Luke chapter 8, it says, bring forth fruit with patience. Did you know that most trees don't produce fruit right away? Sometimes you have to have patience. And even after they start to produce fruit, it's going to be fairly small. And as that tree gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it starts to produce better fruit. You also have to prune that tree, too, to make it produce better fruit. Hmm. Interesting. But uh, what about the second part of Proverbs 11, verse 30? And he that winneth souls is wise. Right? Two points I'd like to make here. Where's this verse written? Old Testament. Um... What is winning souls a reference to? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, going out knocking doors and getting people saved. Uh, how could Solomon have been writing about that before it even happened? They got saved by looking forward to the cross. Another little bath, like uh, fun little thing that they say. Saved by looking forward to the cross. Uh, well, you're rather stupid if you believe that because you see, if you look at the disciples, Jesus is signifying by what death he's supposed to die and they're saying, be it far from thee, Lord. Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to die on the cross. And they're going, no, you aren't. No, no, don't believe it. He dies on the cross. He tells them, I'm going to come up in three days. I'm going to be resurrected and things. They're walking along the road after, you know, he's resurrected. And Jesus is walking with them. And, and you know, and, they, and they're all bummed out and everything. And the Lord says, what's going on? Well, we thought that he that should come should be the one, you know, should be our Messiah, essentially. I'm paraphrasing here. But, you know, and Jesus upbraids them. He rebukes them because they didn't believe. Even after he dies on the cross, resurrects, and he's walking with them, and they're still not believing. What does Thomas say? They're going, Thomas, Jesus is alive, just like he said. Thomas goes, I need to see proof. <laughs> How could they be saved all the way through the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross, and then when the cross situation actually happens, when he dies on the cross, buried, rises from the dead, his own disciples... His 12 disciples don't believe it. Okay, that is one of the biggest, most ridiculous lies. I did a whole study on the thing of this, rebuking this thing of, were they saved by looking forward to the cross? It's a lie. All right? 
They were not saved by looking forward to the cross. See, again, non-dispensational Catholics try to take the whole Bible and say it all teaches the same thing. It's just progressive. The Old Testament it, you know, progresses into the New Testament, and, but they were still doing the same things. They always had eternal security, but it just was like just kind of you know, transitioned or something. <laughs> Stupid nonsense. This verse has nothing to do with preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not one thing to do with preaching the gospel. So why are they using it? Because they're trying to deceive people. That's why. What does it have to do with? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 25. It's the only time in your King James Bible it says winneth is Proverbs 11, verse 30. I thought that was kind of interesting. Winneth souls, I should say it that way. Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 25. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. So we see witnessing there. You're delivering souls. He that winneth souls. You see. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. Did you ever hear somebody say that guy has a real winning personality? You know what Proverbs 11, verse 30 is all about? He that winneth souls. You go through the Old Testament, you'll see the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that, you know, and it's soul and body are connected in the Old Testament. That's why they're talked about, people are talked about like souls. All right? It's talking about being friendly. You're winning people over is what it's talking about. It can't be referring to them preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus hadn't even come yet. You see the deception that this movement is, this hyper soul winning movement? And I apologize. You know, I'm not going to go back and, oh, I got to, you know, undo everything I've done. I have been uh, very guilty of parroting a lot of things that I was taught back through the years, things that I've gone through and whatever else. And I never really looked into the scriptures and said, Lord, what does your word actually teach? And you start to do that, and all of a sudden you start to go, uh oh, <laughs> you know. I'm going to leave the sermons up where I've talked about winning souls. But understand, you know, and there is a sense I realize in which winning souls, he that winneth souls is wise, you know, going out and, and, you know, trying to be kind to the person and trying to talk to them and things like that. Okay, that's fine. Um, but again, the devil's so good at coming in and taking scriptural things and twisting it into something evil. And that's what's happened here. This modern-day Catholic soul-winning movement is an evil system. Again, I'm going to tell you why, you know, get into that more as we continue here. But a true witness delivereth souls. Um, think about the implication there. If you are a true witness, you are not there to get that person into your church building someplace or to get them as a number of I, I led another person to the Lord. You come back, the soul winning teams have been out, you know. And again, I've done the whole thing. Don't even talk to me about it, you people. You know, you get the, in the Baptist church, you know, you get the big map, you know, of all the streets in the city. And you take your highlighters and you go in and you go, okay, we did 3rd Street. Did you guys get 4th Street done? We only had two more houses to go. And when it was time, you know, soul winning time was over for Saturday. So... We'll just do part, we'll highlight part of it, you know, and stuff like this. And, you, and you, you know, we're supposed to take a clipboard and you write down people that have interest and they want you to come back or people that want to be picked up on the bus route and, and you know, people that need a Bible, and people that want more information or whatever else. I've done it, okay? It's all about the numbers. Uh, a true witness delivereth souls. Were we really, truly honest about uh, what we were, you know, really being truthful there? Or are we trying to get more numbers? Are we trying to get our street done? Yeah. But a deceitful witness speaketh lies. You come up with your little, special little thing that you've designed, that you rehearse and you rehearse and you rehearse, so that you can come up and you can get that little sales pitch in there real quick. They get the door open and you only have a few seconds to get the right pitch in there and you can only kind of get in there quickly and whatever. 
got to tell you a little bit of joke. I little joke I heard the one time. Uh, there was these guys that were going out door witness or door witnessing, yeah. door to door witnessing, and uh, they go and they knocked on the door. This older woman comes to the front door and they say, "Pardon me, ma'am, would you? We'd like to talk to you about salvation today." And she said, "I am not interested." And she took that door and she just threw it shut. Just I thought I'm going to slam this door right in their faces. And that door went shut and boom and bounced back open. And she, she just looked at him with rage and she thought, you rude young men, how dare you put your foot in the door, you know, to keep me from shutting the door. And she said, okay, fine. She grabbed that door and she threw it even harder this time. Bam! All of her strength. And the door bounced right back open. And she just, she was so enraged. She thought, okay, I'm going to just break this door. She grabbed it and she went to fling it shut again. And the young guy there at the door said, uh, uh, excuse me, ma'am, um, before you try to slam your door again, you might want to move your cat. So, a little humor there. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, this whole thing of going out door to door, you know, are you really there because, you know, you're wanting to spend time with this person and really tell them the truth and things like this and convict them? Or do you have to get your little sales pitch in there so that you can highlight the street? We got the whole street done. Don't even tell me about it. Again, I remember it. I remember the whole thing. You know? And, you know, I remember, again, being taught. Pastor's son at the one Baptist church I was going to, and he was Bible college educated and the whole deal, and he was like, you know, there's proper ways to do soul winning. And, and if you start to have people ask too many questions, you say, okay, that can come at a later time. But let's, let's talk about your salvation. You know, and you, you bring them back. You always bring them back. And let's get them saved. Let's get them in church. And then they can learn things. I was taught. Don't even tell me, oh, that's not the way we do it. Yeah, right. Let me show you another one that's used. Ezekiel chapter 3. Here's another good one that the Bathlicks like to use to really just guilt trip you. You aren't winning souls? Well, this is, this is the Scriptures for you. You know. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Okay, stop right there for a minute. Um, you will be told, if you don't witness to people, if you aren't winning souls, you got their blood on your hands. Oh my word, I've seen that thing. Again, this, this fear. I mean... If, if you're saved, you want to serve the Lord. If you're saved, you want to be able to witness to people. You want to see people get saved the way you experience what, what the Lord's given you, and you're anxious for it. And sometimes you'll get out there, and, you know, it's so funny. And there's, you're going to see the big difference between men and women. I've seen this thing for years and years. Women will get out there, and they'll try to get a conversation in or whatever else, and and it's just like the, the conversation gets changed or whatever, whatever, and next thing you know, it's over. Or you get to say something and the the woman or whoever you're you know, the woman is witnessing to, they'll go off, you know, and stuff. And and it's usually about three days, you know, that most sisters in the Lord that I know of, they'll just beat themselves up about this. My wife, you know, has done this in the past and things, you know, and, and it's just like did I, do you think I said the right thing? Because I saw that one point, she just seemed to kind of get offended. Should I have said it that way? I wish I should. I could have probably put that scripture in there. Do you think I should have come to her this way? And it's like, the Bible says about, you know, that, that if we deny the Lord before men, he'll deny us, he'll be ashamed of us. Did I deny the Lord by not being able to really get the, the good witness in there and stuff like that uh, and things? You know, I know, and I, I've talked to a lot of you sisters out there and you struggle with that, don't you? You have a chance to, to say something and you kind of say something or you just kind of blurt out some things about the Lord and it just, oh, okay, well, I got to go. And they walk away and you're going, oh, I should have, oh, I, if I, I should have had my Bible with me. Oh, I, I didn't have a tract on me at the time. And, and, and you'll just struggle and struggle and struggle. And, and you, you know, sometimes you break down and you cry and, you know, <laughs> women are emotional. Praise God for that. That's wonderful. That's women are supposed to be that way. 
you know, and it's just like you struggle and struggle and struggle. Men, on the other hand, it becomes a pride issue. Again, you know, I see this thing, you know, I, I got to talking to this guy and stuff like, did you lead him to the Lord? Well, you know, it just didn't come. Why didn't you bring it up? Huh? Are you ashamed of Jesus? Do you, you realize now that you got his blood on your hands? Well, what about you? When's the last time you led somebody to the Lord? You know, and it becomes this pride issue. And I've seen, I've heard, I can't tell you how many times I've heard Baptist preachers and they'll get up there and they will scream about this thing and they will, they will Ezekiel 3 you right in your face. You didn't witness to your co-workers. You got his blood on your hands. You didn't witness to this. You didn't witness to that. You're not a soul winner. You're not going out knocking on doors. You got their blood on your hands. They'll scream at you. Let's look at the, what's actually going on here in the passage. And it's so funny that uh, Baptists, independent fundamental Baptists that preach eternal security will use these scriptures to condemn you for not witnessing to the lost. Because the scriptures teach that you can lose your salvation. And you could in the Old Testament. Let's see about that. Verse 19. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his, his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You mean to tell me if you don't witness, you can lose your soul? All you hardcore Baptists out there that try to use these scriptures to guilt trip those that don't aren't big soul winners like you are? It says there, you've delivered your soul. What happens if you don't witness? Continue. Verse 20. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thy hand, thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, and also thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, why would independent Baptists, the hyper soul winners, come to this passage and try to guilt trip people and say, you've got their blood on your hands if you don't win them to the Lord? And yet they somehow miss the part where it says about you've delivered your soul if you warn them. You think I'm worried about going out in public and keep my mouth shut when I should witness? which would be a bad thing, but I keep my mouth shut. I, did I lose my salvation? Did you lose your salvation? I can guarantee you the most uh, big shot hyper soul winner, they don't always witness for Jesus Christ. Again, Stephen Anderson told a story the one time where he comes back from his soul winning and there's a homeless man laying at the foot, the, the, the steps, the door going into their church building. And Anderson's like, I didn't witness to him. I had, I had things to do. I had, you know, it was a day and it was like, you know, whatever. And he just stepped over top of the guy, went into the church building. Well, according to the teaching here, you try to use this. He lost his soul. He didn't warn the wicked. Of course, Anderson's not saved to begin with. That's another story. But now let's see about soul winning in the Bible. You can go over those scriptures and things, and you know, it's it's interesting that the hyper soul winners, their two biggest things, Proverbs eleven thirty and Ezekiel chapter three, the two biggest things are in another dispensation, the Old Testament. Not even written to Christians. And that's their two biggest motivational scriptures. You need to be winning souls, you're wise, and if you don't, then you have their blood on your hands. That's their two biggest things. Both from the Old Testament before Jesus Christ even came here to die on the cross and pay for your sins. Hmm. Kind of weird why they would do that. But what do you have in Acts chapter 2? We're not going to go through every story in the book of Acts. Again, this could get huge in scope. But what do you have in Acts chapter 2? You have public preaching that begins with sign gifts. Hmm. But that public preaching is what was used to get the people's attention. Not, you know, 
going out and knocking on the people's personal doors and things in their homes and stuff like that. Public preaching. And there's some of the brethren that have that thing done really, really well. Again, uh, again excuse me, um, Patrick and James Battelle, uh, ex-Catholics for Christ. Those guys, if you want to see true biblical public ministry, those guys have it down. They got it just right. Okay? Out on the street, out there, uh, there's other brethren that do the same thing. You go out, you have a sign, you know, Jesus died for sinners or something like that. Nothing this offensive, you know, uh, Westboro Baptist type of God hates fags or something like that. Oh, come on. You know, whatever. <laughs> uh, but you get just a scripture sign. And those guys, they'll stand out there. A lot of times they'll be preaching from the Bible, preaching from the Word of God. And they'll stand there and they'll have, I don't have a tract here with me right now, but they'll, they'll have gospel tracts. And they'll just stand there like this. And, you know, they aren't walking up to people and say, excuse me, you, you know, no, it's just, Sometimes, you know, somebody comes by, would you like a tract? Would you like the gospel? Oh, no? Okay. You? How about you? How about you? Public ministry. That's what was going on in the book of Acts. And uh, you have there, uh, let's see here, verse 41, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Be a good day's work for uh, soul winners, you know, these people. Um, but look at verse 47, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. See, that's really the whole issue here. I mean, I can build up to this thing, but let's just cut to the chase. The whole issue is God's the one that does the saving. We're going to see this as we continue through the study. God is the one who's soul winning. He's the real soul winner, if you want to use that term. And if you're not doing things God's way, you're not doing anything at all except damning people to hell. That's all that you're doing. And this hyper soul winning movement, that is the majority of what they're doing. And I say the majority because I do think that sometimes people can get saved as a mistake, you know. But it's only because that person, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, we're going to look at these scriptures, but it's only because that person has had seeds planted and someone else has come along to water those seeds. Let's just say somebody has been wondering about the Lord and some Catholic soul winner comes along and they start to show them scriptures and things like this and the person genuinely gets saved at that point in time. But it's only because there's other work there and because the Lord worked in that person's heart. I'm going to tell you, the vast majority of these, quote-unquote, souls that are one, they produce no fruit. And you'll see these guys talking about that. You know, oh, some of our converts really don't turn out, or they don't come to church, or they don't this, or they don't that, or you kind of hear they got kind of messed up. And again, I used to do the door-to-door -door thing, and we run into these people. You know, I remember the, the one story. I've told this before, but I uh, went to this one house, and, um, you know, this guy steps out. And you got a big old cigar and, you know, he's smoking and everything else and just foul mouth, whatever else. And, uh, yeah, I used to go to Liberty Baptist Church. And he's like, I went back, you know, in the days when uh, it blew up. Big church split, you know, the whole thing fell apart. Created a whole bunch of other little satellite churches, you know. <laughs> you know, and we get people like that all the time. Living wickedly. I mean, we're not talking about a Christian, new Christian struggling with cigarettes and trying to get rid of it. We're talking about somebody that's been there, done that, and they've moved on with their life. They aren't living for Jesus. They could care less about the Bible or anything else. Right back to the world. False convert. We ran into false converts all the time. And I'll tell you right now, the false converts were ten times worse than any of the people that never heard about the Bible. I'm going to show you the scriptures on that later too in this study. But let's go to the next one. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 35. And you know, again, I'm just going to I'm going to be saying some things. Normally, I, you know, when I put a get together a sermon, it's like I kind of want to build up to certain make points and whatever else. I try to be very organized with that. Um, if you'll notice, many times when I'm preaching, we're going through the Bible. I'm not saying go back here, go here, go here, go here, go there. It's, you know, 
Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter, you know, I try to be organized with it. But, you know, I just want to get, there's so much I want to say with this study. And I'm going to just, you know, kind of ruin the surprise, so to speak, here a couple times. I'm going to tell you right now, soul winning is about you being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And yes, you're going to be nervous. Yes, there's going to be those times and stuff like this. But I'm going to tell you, real true soul winning, when you have the Holy Spirit speaking through you and you know the Lord has set up a, a divine appointment where He's using you and He's speaking through you, it's the most exhilarating, most exciting thing. It is just, oh, it's, it brings such joy. It doesn't bring fear of, oh, I should have witnessed and oh, I should have done this. And, What's everybody going to think if they find out that I didn't win them to, to Jesus Christ? And oh. It's not fear and dread based. And that's what's wrong with a lot of this hyper soul winning thing. They use guilt, they use fear tactics to get you to win souls. And you actually study the Bible and you're like, this stuff's not even in there. But let's continue here. Acts chapter 8 verses 26 through 35. The story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. All right, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Why? Why didn't the Lord tell him? The Lord put something in his heart, and he said, Hey, get up, go down that way. Remember I was... Cornerstone Baptist Church I went to down in uh, Lidditz, Pennsylvania the one time there was a African um, preacher, pure African guy and he had the, the whole accent and stuff and he goes I remember him preaching, I'll never forget the sermon and he said, he said about sometimes he said, God wants you to have the, you know, a Gaza Road experience and he said, what is your Gaza Road? I remember that I'll never forget that, you know I mean, real true, you know Saved man, been through all kinds of persecution over there, the Muslims attacking him and stuff like this. I mean, interesting, interesting sermon. But God will give you a God's Road experience. It's called a divine appointment. Where all of a sudden it's just like going over that way. <laughs> you know, and you'll get this like, hey, you know what? I better go to the store today or whatever else. You know? And I've had those times. The Lord's, Lord's set up appointments and things. I was out in the parking lot at Lowe's one time. I had to go, and, and you know, shortly after Oliver was born, and I, so I left the two, my wife and Oliver here, and I went to, to Lowe's, and and uh, I'm out in the parking lot loading some lumber in because I had to build some things here and stuff. And, and I remember this employee comes out, and he's just like, he's up in uh, Presque Isle, this city up above us a little ways. And this employee comes out, and he's like, oh, he's like, hey, do you need some help, you know, loading? And I was like, yeah, sure, that'd be fine. And I just was kind of like, okay, Lord, you want me to say something, you know? And, you know, very, I mean, it was in the winter time too. So it wasn't like they're just out hanging out in the parking lot. So he's helped me load and he looks out the back of my truck and I bumper stickers there and he goes, you a Christian? And I said, yes, I am. And had a great chance to witness time. It was a really, really neat time. And I was just, you know, I was like bouncing off the walls coming back. It was such a neat thing. God's a road experience. See? And again, I've heard from a lot of you. You know, you're just like, I got to talk to so and so, and the Lord, Lord opened up a door I could witness to him. Hmm? That's when you know the Lord's in it. But let's continue. Verse 27 And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Look at this. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. God tells him, Go down to the Gaza road. He goes down and the Lord says, See that chariot? Go. Hmm. Not some forced duty. He's out there, you know, trying to get that street crossed off on the map because they got to go out soul winning this week, and they're gonna, we're gonna reach the greater, you know, area there of, you know. Let's continue, verse thirty. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? 
and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Were there some seeds planted in that Ethiopian eunuch's mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the seeds were already there. He was already interested, you see. All he needed was somebody to water the word. Uh, let's continue here. Verse 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the, speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And he ends up getting saved. And he gets baptized in verse 37. If you have a King James Bible, if you don't have a King James Bible, verse 37 is probably going to not be in there. Or at least in a footnote or something like this. Use a King James Bible in other words. But you see, very interesting there. Look at how the progression of events happened there. God put it into Philip's mind, go on down to the Gaza Road. He didn't say, you need to get out soul winning. What are you doing, Philip? When's the last time that you personally led someone to the Lord? Mm -mm. Hey, uh, Philip? Yes, Lord? Gaza Road, get going. You guys riding on a chariot. You know, if he'd have been there at the wrong time, just a few minutes later or whatever else, he wouldn't have even caught the guy. God set it up. Again, these people have this warped thing, this hyper soul winning thing. There's going to be people in hell. According to hyper soul winners, there will be people in hell because Christians didn't witness to them. Do you ever realize how stupid that is? Get up there. Lord says, uh, um, depart from me, cursed in everlasting fire. The person says, huh? huh? What? 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 You rejected my son. I did? I never even knew about your son. The Lord says, oh, yeah, oh, nuts. That's a problem. You know, well, I don't know what to do now because a Christian should have witnessed to you and they didn't. I'm sorry. I, I got to damn you to hell. Sorry. <laughs> what? You know? Who's, in really, who's really in control of the salvation here? In control of winning someone to Jesus Christ and saving their soul. God is going to put you into a position, into a time where you will have your Gaza Road experience. Where God is going to say, go down that way. Okay, you get there and the Lord's going to say, speak to that person. Or it's going to start a conversation and things like that. I've had that thing happen many, many times. Somebody comes up and they say, Boy, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? And you say, Yeah, the Lord's really giving us a good day. Oh, are you a Christian? Thank you for asking. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Yeah. You're going to get those times. And they start to ask you. You know why? Because they're looking for God, they're searching. And at some point in time, the thing that starts that salvation experience is when you say, I'm at the end of my rope, I need help. And many people, God, if you're real, I want to know. And they mean it in sincerity. I need help, God, please. And God will set in motion what's going to happen that will ultimately lead to your salvation. Hmm. So why is it that you feel guilty when you don't witness to everybody that you run into? Who's supposed to be setting up salvation? I wonder how many people Philip walked past when he was going down that Gaza road. Did he preach the gospel to each one of them? No. Why? God had one man picked out. A divine appointment set up. Philip, go to the Gaza Road. Okay, Philip, you're here. That chariot right there. Here it comes. Talk to him. Walks over and he sees a guy and he's going, reading the book of Isaiah. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? How can I except some man guide me? Can you tell me? Yeah, come on up in. 
divine appointment. Let's continue. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Huh? What? Forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia? No, 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 no. Because you see, you need to, you need to, you need to preach the word. You need to get out there. You need to knock doors, and you need to get people saved, and you need to soul win, and you need to cross the streets off on the map, and say we've covered Asia. Isn't that weird? I remember back when we had our house church down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Just before I knew my wife, we wanted to go out to this uh, big, huge Babel building. Um, it was called a uh, Lancaster County LCBC, Lancaster County Bible Church, I think. Rock and roll, big thing, you know, and you'd be like a hundred yards away from the building, and you could feel the beat of the music in your chest from a hundred yards away, with the doors and the windows closed, you know, big wicked thing. And we went out, we went out again and again and again. Weather, you know, was really bad. We couldn't make it out there. And next time we go out there, and it'd be the services would be canceled, or they'd. You know, all this stuff. Finally got there. We just kept on pushing to get this thing done. Got there. We weren't there for, you know, five minutes. And uh, security got called on us. Kicked us out. <laughs> you know, what was going on? Holy Spirit wasn't in it. He was not there. We were uh, forbid forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word. Now, how does that work, again, if you're a soul winning, this hyper soul winning thing? You come back and you say, well, it didn't work. The Lord doesn't want us down there. I mean, would that be a valid reason? You come out, you know, hey, uh, we're going to be going out. We're going to have a soul winning marathon in uh, whatever area. And uh, brother, you and, and sister, you, you, you go on down, you know, and you be, you be silent partner. You be soul winner. And you go down there and you get that street done. And you come back after the end of the thing and say, how'd you do? Can we cross off your street? Um, well, no, actually, the Holy Ghost forbid us to preach there, to preach the gospel. Do you think that they would say, oh, well, praise the Lord, I'm glad that you were open to the Holy Spirit's leading? No, they'd say, you didn't even witness to anybody? Okay, brother so-and-so, you, you go on down there and do it. Why? They got a map. They got to cross off the streets. They got this city and that city and this city and that city that they need to do their little uh, crusades. Catholic crusade. Oh, I don't know. Shouldn't say that. Weird, isn't it? Let's jump down to verse 13 in Acts chapter 16 here. And look at the distinction here. Acts chapter 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, uh, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. No, 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 no. See, they had their special soul winning little thing that they say. Um, if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you would go? Can I take a few minutes to show you from the scriptures how that you can know that you will have eternal life through Jesus Christ? It will only take a minute. Let me just have a minute of your time. The Lord opened her heart. They're forbidden of the Holy Ghost over here to preach the word in Asia. Over here, Lydia has her heart opened by the Lord. It's almost like God is controlling who's going to get saved in law and who's going to, you know, because he looks at their heart. It's not Calvinism. Okay, don't don't put try to put that on me. All that, you know, there's elect and non-elect. No, 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 no. God looks at the heart and he sees, are these people wanting to get saved? No. Don't even waste your time on them. Again, have you ever seen that? As a Bible-believing Christian, there are certain people you try everything that you can to witness to that person, and it's just like, I'm just wasting my time with this person. They don't want to hear it. And you pray, and you pray, and you pray. Again, I dealt with that with my Catholic neighbor, former Catholic neighbor. He's dead and in hell now. And I prayed. I prayed fervently for a chance to preach the gospel to that guy. I finally got my chance, and he cussed me out and told me he's never going to believe the way I believe. And he died and went to hell within a half a year. 
But uh, let's continue here. Whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, if, we have judged, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And here's the contrast. God opened her heart. She got saved. Look at this. Verse 16 through 18. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said, If you were to die tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Um, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. And then Paul witnessed to her. You mean to tell me a devil-possessed girl could be walking around saying, these men, what she say there? These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. She's yelling it. These men are the servants of the Most High God, showing us the way of salvation. Did she get saved? No. Did Paul turn around and say, let me just take a few minutes and show you here from the Bible how you can know for sure. Not on your life. He being grieved. Huh? Why would he be grieved if this woman's trying to say that he's a great soul winner? Servant of the Most High God, showing us the way of salvation. What's she saying? She's trying to call him a great soul winner. And he's grieved and he turns around and he says, get out of her, stinking devil, you know. Why didn't he witness to her? Why didn't he lead her to the Lord? Why? God wasn't in it. Hmm. Kind of a weird thing. 